pray sometimes with my granny because she's she believes i do pray yeah i pray every night before i go to sleep i talk to myself a lot i've prayed before i have to pray every now and then when i was a child i prayed yes when I pray, I just feel totally at ease and calm, to be honest with you. Because my school, like, we had assembly and they, they may just, like, sit there and pray. No, I, I've never prayed to a higher being or uh, something more powerful than me. I prayed, I guess, because I was younger, just to, for God to keep watch over my family. Maybe before an exam, if I'm nervous, and stuff like that. I prayed for people to get better. I prayed for... Um, success in my life, that sounds a bit greedy. I pray for the people that I love, I pray for things that I want to happen. I pray that I could find my remote control, <laughs> that always worked. Uh, if something really bad happens, you'll see me on my knees. I have a uh, friend called Toby, who when he was a child growing up, thought that God's name was Peter. And the reason being is whenever he heard people praying, they would say, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. So they, he thought they were saying, thanks, Peter, God. Now, as a child, when I grew up, my uh, knowledge of prayer was probably even less than that. Um, at home, we never prayed. And the only experience I had was occasionally if there was a chapel service at school. And to be honest, it was so boring I normally nodded off. But I suppose if I did pray, it was when I was in trouble. Like so many people, we saw that on the clip even. It's maybe when we're in trouble that we do pray. A number of years ago, Sarah and I were on a very small uh, twin propeller plane going to Thailand. And we were coming into land just as a massive storm was hitting. It was monsoon season. And the f first three attempts to land had to be aborted. And on the approach of the fourth attempt, the pilot came over the tannoy and somewhat unhelpfully said, ladies and gentlemen, this time we shall be landing at the airport because I am running out of fuel. A little bit too much information. Now, I can tell you at that point, there wasn't a single atheist left on the airplane. Everyone was praying. But I wonder, what is or has been your experience of prayer, if any? Just changing the subject slightly, um, I wonder how many emails you send every week. Why don't you raise your hand if you reckon you send more than 100 emails a week? Who reckons they send more than 100 emails per week? Okay, now keep your hand raised if you send more than 200 a week. More than 300 a week? There's still a hand raised. Down. More than 400? How many? Three, 350? Wow. That's a, you don't sell Viagra by any chance, do you? No. No, that's a joke, don't worry. Well, you know, President Bill Clinton, when he was president of America, famously only sent two emails whilst he was president. One was to the troops on the front line, and the other was to a 77-year-old astronaut. Now, I don't know whether your uh, approach to prayer is more like the 350 emails a week approach or whether you're more in the Bill Clinton camp of little and often, uh, little and not so often. But prayer is the beginning of how we build a relationship with God. And relationship is at the heart of the Christian faith. In uh, Ephesians chapter 2, Verse 18, it says this, For through him, that is Jesus, we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. So Christian prayer is firstly to the Father. Now, I don't know what your concept or picture is of God. Maybe male, bearded, disinterested or at best, a little bit angry at us. But Jesus says, when you pray, pray 
our Father in heaven. Jesus used this Aramaic word, Abba, which literally means daddy or dad when he referred to God. This is an intimate relationship. And Jesus says we too can have that same relationship with God. And when you suddenly think of God as Father, then maybe we want to speak to him a little bit more. So Christian prayer is to the Father. Secondly, it is through the Son. During the American Civil War, there was one soldier who was told he could be exempt from bat- battle, the battlefield because of an extreme set of tragic circumstances that had happened to his family. So the soldier went to the White House to try and gain this exem- exemption. But when he got to the gates of the White House, the guards there refused him entry. So he sat down on a park bench near the White House, somewhat dejected. And a little boy noticed this and came over to him and asked him if he was okay. So the soldier told the little boy about his problem. And to his amazement, the boy said, okay, well, follow me. So he thought, well, I've got nothing to lose. So he followed the little boy, and the boy walked straight up to the White House and through the gates. So the man just followed him. The guards didn't stop them. They went into the White House, they walked down the corridors, and as they did so, soldiers began saluting them. Then the boy walked straight up to the Oval Office. He didn't even stop to knock, he just walked straight into the Oval Office. So the man just followed him. And as they walked in the Oval Office, there standing up was President Abraham Lincoln talking to the Secretary of State. And Abraham Lincoln turned round, he looked at the boy and said, Todd, what is it? And the boy said, Dad, this man needs your help. He had access through the sun. And in the same way, you and I have access to the Father through the Son, through Jesus. Jesus has removed that partition, that barrier of sin between us and God. It's been said that if you take the word Christ out of Christian, you're just left with Ian and he can't help you. But Jesus can and does. So Christian prayer is to the Father, it's through the Son, and it's by the Holy Spirit. You might be thinking, well, this all sounds good, but where do I begin with praying? How do I start? The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8, verse 26, says this. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us. You know, the Holy Spirit enables us to communicate with God. This is why I've kept on going on about the weekend away in Malacca and why that's so important. Because looking at the person and the work of the Holy Spirit helps us to pray. Now you might say, okay, that's fine, Miles, but why should we bother? Why should we pray? And I'm just going to read from Matthew chapter 6, verse 6. This is the words of Jesus. He says, but when you pray, go into your room Close the door and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Interestingly, Jesus there says, when you pray. He assumes that we will. Because communication is the most natural thing in a relationship. And he says, when you pray, God will reward you. But what are those rewards? Well, firstly, there's peace. Prayer brings us peace. St. Paul, again, in Philippians uh, chapter 4, verse 6, says this. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God 
which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I don't know whether you ever wake up in the, in the morning with a sense of foreboding. You know, we can either wake up and say, oh God, it's morning. Or we can say, it's morning, God. We get peace when we pray and communicate with God. Secondly, reward, we get a new perspective. When we pray, sometimes our circumstances might not change, but we get a new perspective of them. We begin to get God's perspective of that circumstance. And then thirdly, the third reward we get is power. The power in prayer that things are changed. In 2013, you may remember the uh, premiership football player, Fabrice Mwamba. He was a 22-year-old footballer playing in the British Premier League. And in the middle of one of the football matches, he suddenly collapsed on the pitch. The medics ran over to him. They, at first, they thought maybe he's been fouled. But what had happened was that his heart had stopped beating. And uh, they tried to revive him, and they could not. And after a number of minutes, all of the uh, supporters in the stadium started to realize that there probably was something seriously wrong with this young footballer, Fabrice Mwamba. And through the use of technology, the supporters started uh, something trending on social media. The hashtag was hashtag pray for Mwamba. And this went viral very, very quickly because millions of people were watching the game on TV live and they got the hashtag. And everybody started hashtag pray for, M for Mwamba. And people started praying for this guy. Well, they, they took him off the pitch and his heart still wouldn't start. In fact, his heart was completely stopped. It was dead for 78 minutes. Now, normally, when your heart's not been working for 78 minutes, you stay dead. And if by some chance you did not stay dead, you'd definitely be brain damaged. Well, amazingly, after 78 minutes, Fabrice Mwamba's heart started beating again. But here's the amazing thing. He was completely fine. No brain damage. He's made a complete recovery. Just this last year, he was being interviewed, and Mwamba said this, I am walking proof of the power of prayer. Now, was that just a coincidence? It was William Temple, a former Archbishop of Canterbury, who said this, when I pray, coincidences happen. When I don't, they don't. So does God answer our prayers? Well, I think it can be helpful to think of it a bit like a traffic light system. Sometimes when we pray, we get a green light. We get a clear yes from God, and the prayer seems to be answered very easily. Sometimes when we pray, we might get a red light, a very clear no from God, and a door sort of immediately closes. But sometimes we get an amber light. It's like the answer is wait, or there's no immediate obvious answer at all. What do we do when that happens? Well, the important thing is to hold on to the fact that God is good. We can trust him. We might have good plans for our own lives, but he has the best plans for us. My grandmother always used to say that when she was uh, uh, younger, she prayed and prayed that God would let her marry this particular boy. Well, they didn't get married. 
And she ended up marrying my grandfather. And she said, I'm so glad that God didn't answer my prayer initially. Corrie ten Boom put it this way. When a train goes through a tunnel and it gets dark, you don't throw away the ticket and jump off. You sit still and trust the driver. God has good things for your life. Prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. It's laying hold of his willingness. So how and when do we pray? Well, you can pray whenever and wherever you like. You can pray silently or you can pray loudly. You can pray with your eyes closed or with your eyes open. You can pray set prayers like the Lord's Prayer or you can pray with your own words, however you like. But I find it's helpful to have uh, a set time in the day, uh, maybe in the morning when you, at the start of the day, you can just pray for a few minutes or at the end of the evening. And um, I, I tend to try and keep it simple, keep it real, and keep it going. Keep it simple. Some people like to use the acronym ACTS to help structure their prayers. A stands for adoration. Just begin by praising God. C stands for confession. Just say sorry for anything that you may have done wrong. T stands for thanksgiving. Just thank God for all the good things in your life. And S stands for supplication. That's a word meaning present your requests or ask God for stuff. Acts. Keep it simple. Keep it real. Say what's really on your heart. Don't pretend with God because he knows what's in your heart anyway, even better than you do. And keep it going. And it's a dialogue. It's not just you talking to God, but it's also listening so that we can hear what he has to say. And this is where uh, reading the Bible is important as well. Now, some today might see the Bible as rather dull, maybe an outdated rule book. So what's so special about the Bible? Well, it's uniquely popular. It's the most successful literary creation ever. If you think about it, it's completely international. Homer was translated into 40 languages, Shakespeare into 60, Harry Potter into 67 languages. The Bible, well, that's been translated into well over 2,000 languages, 10 times more than any other book. And it's the world's bestseller. Every year, 44 million copies are sold. If the sales of the Bible were reflected in bestseller lists, then n- nothing would ever get a look in. It's uniquely popular. It's also uniquely powerful. My story, like so many others, is that it was reading the Bible that brought me to faith in Jesus. It has the power to change lives and change societies. And it's uniquely precious. The psalmist says about the scriptures that they're more precious than gold. When Queen Elizabeth II of the Commonwealth was crowned, she was handed a Bible with these words. We present you with this book, the most valuable thing that this world affords. Now, why is that? Well, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, Jesus says this. It is written... People do not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. As I've said before, there's a physical hunger that we all have, but there's also a deep spiritual hunger that runs in every human heart. And Jesus says, you can't live on bread alone, but every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. And that word, therefore, comes forth is continuous tense. It's like a stream pouring forth, God's longing to communicate to us. And he speaks primarily to us through the Bible. You know, uh, we looked at this right at the start of Alpha, that God's supreme revelation of himself is in a person, in 
Jesus. The writer to the Hebrews in the New Testament says this, In the past God spoke in many and various ways, but in these last days he's spoken through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus is God's ultimate revelation of himself. But the main way we know about Jesus is through the written revelation, the Bible. And um, uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says this, All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what is right. The word there in the Greek for inspired is theonoustos, which literally means God breathed. So what the writer is saying here is that the Bible is God speaking, not in a way that God literally dictated the Bible, because he used human authors. Actually, over a 1,500-year period, uh, the Bible was made up of at least 40 authors. Some were kings, scholars, philosophers, fishermen, poets, statesmen, historians, doctors. And they wrote different types of literature making up the Bible, such as history, poetry, prophecy, and letters. The Bible is 100% the work of human beings, but it's also 100% inspired by God. Well, how can that be? Let me use an analogy, if I may. Sir Christopher Wren was a famous architect. He built and designed that iconic building in London, St. Paul's Cathedral. He started aged 44 in the year 1676, and it took 35 years to build, and the cathedral was completed in 1711 when Wren was 79 years of age. So Sir Christopher Wren built St. Paul's Cathedral. But of course, he actually didn't lay a single stone. Other people did that. But there was one mind, one architect, one inspiration behind it. And so it is with the Bible. Many different writers, but one architect, one inspiration behind it. God himself. Now, that, this doesn't mean there aren't any difficulties with the Bible. You know, if you're um, a, a Christian, you can't be a Christian unless you believe that God is love. But what about the suffering in the world? This is a moral problem. But that doesn't mean to say we reject Christianity. We need to wrestle with it. And when we come across tricky things in the Bible, we need to keep going. And rather than rejecting it, try and explore, ask questions, and wrestle. And I found that with that particular example, the more I wrestle with it, the more I find I understand the nature of suffering, and also the more I understand how God is perfect love. It's a bit like a crossword. Sometimes you uh, get a clue straight away, and then there's another clue, mm, I don't understand it, I don't get it. You don't stop the crossword, you move on, move on to the next clue, and you fill that one in, and the next clue, and you fill that one in, and then suddenly you go back to that clue you didn't get, and now, ah, I get it now, it's that. Reading the Bible is a bit like that. If you get stuck, don't stop, move on, and you'll probably find later on you understand the bit that you struggled with before. So back to 2 Timothy 3.16. It says, all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. In other words, it's the supreme authority for what we believe for teaching. That's why we, we always try and quote some of the Bible each week on Alpha. Now, some people say, well, I don't want a rule book. Isn't that rather restrictive? I want to be free. I don't want to lose my freedom to enjoy life. And the Bible would take that away. But is that really true? Does the Bible take away our freedom? Or does it actually give us freedom? 
You know, God didn't uh, give us guidelines of how to live because he hates us, but rather because he loves us. He wants you to enjoy life to the full. He didn't say, don't murder, because killing is such fun. You know, he didn't say, don't steal, because wouldn't it be miserable if we couldn't steal? There was one man who said, um, oh, I don't read the Bible because it interferes with my work. Someone said, well, what's your work? He said, I'm a pickpocket. God didn't say, don't commit adultery because he wanted to ruin our fun. He didn't want people to get hurt because he loves us. The Bible actually brings us freedom to live life to the full. And not only has God spoken through the Bible, but he continues to speak to us through it. It's ongoing communication. It's about a relationship. It's a, like a love letter to us by God. In John chapter 5, verse 39, Jesus says this, You diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me and have life. You know, for some people, the Bible is no, nothing more than just a well-thumbed manual for life. They study it, they learn it, they underline it, they might even try and read it in the original Hebrew for the Old Testament and the original Greek for the New Testament. But somehow, they can miss the whole point. This is all about Jesus, having a relationship with him. And um, that's at the heart of Christianity. And he speaks to us through it. So how might we hear him speak in practice through the Bible? Well, like with prayer, we need to set aside a time. And what I do is I, I do the two together. I read the Bible and I pray at the same time uh, in the morning. And time is your most valuable possession. If money is power, time is life. So try and get a pattern. Do you know, if you read the Bible for only 15 minutes per day, one, five, 15 minutes per day, you'll read the whole thing in a year. And um, so try and find a regular slot if you've got young children, maybe the morning doesn't work. Maybe it has to be after bedtime in the evening. But get a slot that works for you. Try and get a rhythm. And it's also helpful to find a place. Jesus often went off, we read in the scriptures, to a solitary place to pray. So maybe in the morning or in the evening, find that favorite armchair that's your favorite chair or that, that room in the house where you can be alone with God. And um, often people find it helpful in the morning. Maybe you wake up get a cup of coffee to wake you up, take your Bible, maybe have a notepad with you. So if, oh gosh, I need to go and buy a chicken, you can write that down. So you're not then distracted in your thoughts or whatever. And um, then, then what I do is I just say, uh, God, please, would you speak to me now through what I'm about to read in the Bible? And then read the passage. And then once you've read the passage, Simply ask yourself these three questions. Firstly, what does it say? Secondly, what does it mean? And thirdly and crucially, how does this apply to my life? How is God speaking into my day today through this? And then once you've done that, respond in prayer. Talk to God about it. And then, of course, the key is then putting it into practice. And this is where the, the Bible in One Year app, I find, is so helpful because it gives you a passage to read through every day. And that second question, what does it mean? The commentary really helps you with that. Now, some days, if I'm honest, I read the Bible in the morning, and then by about 10.30, I couldn't even tell you what I read that morning. It's kind of gone in one ear and out the other. But even when those days when it feels a bit mundane, it is still fed your soul in ways that we don't even realize. 
And then there are other days when it doesn't feel mundane. Actually, when opening the scriptures feels hugely profound. I'll give you an example. Um, there was a time when Sarah and I, 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 I was working uh, for a consumer goods company, and Sarah and I were wondering whether or not God might be calling me to go and work uh, as a pastor, actually as my job, full time, and to leave my office job and do this as my, as my job, or whether or not God wanted me more involved in the church, but maybe just in a volunteer capacity. And we were wrestling with this question. So we sat down and the two of us prayed together one morning. And then when we said amen at the end, Sarah turned to me and said, you know what, Miles, I think a, a reference, a scripture reference popped into my head when we prayed then. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 13. Do you know what that is? And I said, I've no clue. So she said, let's look it up. So we, we looked it up. And it's where the Apostle Paul writes and says, and don't you know, those who serve at the altar shall make their living at the altar. And for us, that was pretty significant. It felt like in response to our prayer, God had spoken and he used the Bible to speak to us. And I suppose I want to finish with this question. Do you think that the Lord may be trying to speak to you? And if so, will you let him? May we pray. Lord, I thank you for uh, your word, the Bible. And we thank you for the opportunity to get to know you and communicate with you in prayer. And Lord, I ask that all of us here might begin to build that relationship with you in prayer and as we read the Bible. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen.